Next on Conversations at KCTS 9, documentary filmmaker Ken Burns. History is the set of questions we in the present ask of the past. Producer of films such as the Civil War, jazz, baseball, and the war, he brings the past back to life for all of us. If you know where you've been, you can sort of have a sense of where you are and where you might be going. Up next, how he turned a passion for history into not just a career, but a mission. Civil War opened a lot of doors, but it also uh, made us, what's the word, hungrier. We wanted to, to take on, tackle even more difficult subjects. And his newest film, The National Parks, stories about the people who dedicated their lives to creating and saving precious lands. This is a hugely important institution we've created and requires all the, the vigorous vigilance that we can muster uh, to protect it. Ken Burns, next on Conversations at KCTS 9. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members, and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Ken Burns, welcome to Conversations, and welcome back to Seattle. We've talked uh, numerous times, and it's always fun to have conversations with you uh, about the work that you're doing. Um, at, as we speak right now, you have a new documentary that will be coming out in the fall about national parks, and we'll talk about that. But I first wanted to talk about how you became interested in filmmaking. You know, my dad had a curfew. Uh, my mom died when I was 11, and he had a pretty strict curfew for my younger brother and me. Uh, but he relaxed it if there was a movie late on TV or if there was something down at the local cinema that we could look or a film festival. And I found myself staying up till 2 a.m. on a school night uh, watching films, and I was struck by their power. It was the only time I'd ever seen my dad cry was at a movie. And that was a big deal because we just had this personal tragedy in our family. And here one began to sense that there was something really unique about this medium. And so I vowed then that I would be a feature filmmaker. Um, and I ended up at school, uh, Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, with teachers who were social documentary still photographers who reminded me that there's much more drama in what is and what was than in anything of the imagination and that you could live inside a photograph. And I, I think the combination of all of that conspired to turn me around and face towards documentary and then American history. Talk a little bit more about your father. Tell me, what was he like? Well, uh, did he have an interest in filmmaking? Well, you know, it's, it is very interesting. He um, was a cultural anthropologist. Um, and I think that there is no small amount of anthropology in the work that I do. Uh, he was also an amateur photographer, still photographer, and one of my very earliest memories is of a dark room that he built in the basement of our house in Newark, Delaware. And can you imagine the effect on a boy of three or four looking at um, a, a photograph coming up through that magic alchemy of, of developing and seeing a picture emerge from a white sheet. It was really powerful stuff for me. And in, in some ways, I think that I've been honoring uh, what he was interested in and what he's been doing uh, all my life. What about your mom? You mentioned the fact that you lost her at an early age. You were 11? Yeah, there was not a moment in my life when I wasn't aware that she was sick and then by the time I was six years old that she was dying, that this was something that was going to happen at any moment. And cancer. Sure. Cancer and spreading and, and she was a heroic figure, about as generous and brave a person as I've ever met. And, and I hope that, it, that at times, or at least I've been able to give to my three daughters something of her courage and his uh, intelligence and, and, and smarts as, as we've gone along. But it was a, a strange mixture. And it was, it's interesting that you bring all that up because many, many years after she died, I, I was aware and had confessed to someone that I could never remember the date that she died. Like I could, I could see the day coming. Mm -hmm and then I would always be receding, but I wasn't present for when it actually happened. And um, 
this person said, well, that's just a young person's, uh, you know, wanting to, you know, magical thinking, keeping their mom alive, even though I was now 40 years old by this time. And so I told another friend, uh, a psychologist, uh, a man who I respected, and I said, I seem to be keeping my mother alive. And he said, what do you think you do for a living? And I said, excuse me? He said, you wake the dead. You make Abraham Lincoln and Jackie Robinson and uh, you know Louis Armstrong come alive. Who do you think you're really trying to wake up? And then you begin to realize that this thing that we call history, which for many of us is like castor oil that you hold your nose and take. You know it's good for you, but not good tasting. Um, this thing in which we think has broad national themes. In America, the shorthand for history is the, is the set of presidencies punctuated by wars and the generals who fought them. Uh, but history is really a, a, a sort of the collection of all the individual memories of all the people who have participated in that. And in that way, that's an intimate, emotional kind of archaeology. And, and that's what I think I've been trying to do. Um, I'm not sure whether I entirely subscribe to that perhaps dime store psychology of waking the dead, but it's a good way of understanding what history could be. Uh, that it could be something that's not rooted in sentimentality or nostalgia, but rooted in something emotional and higher than the normal, just rational world that we live in of words and parsing everything with language. There are some things more powerful and more complicated uh, than those words. Uh, we know this from music. We know this from our faith. We know this when we walk outside, particularly in this magnificent city, and look at the, the, the nature that surrounds us at, at every blush. And we're uh, inspirited. We're made bigger. Uh, by these awarenesses. And I think that's also the role of art. Tolstoy said, art's the transfer of emotion from one person to another. And that's about as good a definition as I could think of. I think I heard you say once uh, that one of the things about what you do is preserving history, but it also helps to build our future. Well, you know, it's funny. The past is gone. The events of the past are gone. But that's different from history. History is the set of questions we in the present ask of the past. Mm -hmm. And so it's certainly considering those past events, but it's also aware of what we're scared of, what we're excited about, what we're hopeful for, what we wish, what we're fearful of. And, and so the questions we ask at any given time, you know, the Civil War hasn't changed, but when I was a little boy, it was a different sort of thing than when I was an adult and making a film about the Civil War. We were asking different questions. We weren't interested in the list of regiments or guns or armaments or things like that. We were interested in all sorts of stories that had an emotional uh, context to them that was about uh, the liberation of African Americans. We'd always assume that they were passive bystanders to the struggle, but in fact they were active, dedicated, self-sacrificing soldiers in an intensely personal drama of self-liberation. Now. Nothing in the Civil War had changed except our perspective, except the questions we were asking. And so you begin to understand that, that history is not just about was, as William Faulkner said, but is. And then conversely, you begin to understand that if you know where you've been, you can sort of have a sense of where you are and where you might be going. So strangely enough, as, as I sometimes have the privilege of giving commencement addresses, I often say, you know, the worst cliche of a commencement address is uh, your, your, your future lies ahead of you. <laughs> well, I always say your, your future lies behind you in the past that you have yet to discover and, and, and know. Back to your parents, did your father really get to know what you what you did for a living and appreciate what you did? Or he did. did. he say, go get a job, would you? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> it was very funny. He was very, very proud. He, he, he lived uh, till 2001 and was uh, able to see, you know, Civil War and baseball and jazz and, and many of the other films, uh, smaller films that we had done. But I do remember the day I decided to do the Civil War, I was visiting him with uh, his then two-year-old uh, granddaughter. and. Uh, I finished reading a book called The Killer Angels, a story of the Battle of Gettysburg, and I finished it on the afternoon of Christmas Day, and I shut the book, and my dad walked into the living room of his house and said, and I said, I know what I'm going to do for my next project. And he said, what's that? And I said, the Civil War. And he goes, oh, what part? And I said, all of it. And he just sort of shook his head like, <laughs> like my idiot son and walked out the door. So, um, you know, he, he didn't swallow everything hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. You know, your work and the body of work that you've done, and I guess the things that um, 
really stand out is that you've dealt with issues of a lot of issues of race and justice. But also, someone was telling me that you were addressing some people uh, yesterday at a at a meeting and uh, gathering, and you said it's really about race and space. Well, that comes from, um, and it's true. You know, the great sub theme of America is race. I mean, it, it's it's undeniable when when you say we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The beginning of the second sentence of the Declaration. The man who wrote those words, the man who wrote our creed, owned a hundred other human beings when he wrote that. Never saw the contradiction, never saw the hypocrisy, and more important, never saw fit in his lifetime to free them and set in motion an American narrative that is constantly struggling with the question of race. It's always there when we think we've solved it, when we think it's gone away, uh, when it's right staring us in the face, we've always had to deal with it. Uh, but 10 years ago, uh, Dayton Duncan, who is the co-producer and co-writer on a number, or writer on a number of the projects uh, I've done, he and I were making a film on Mark Twain and we were interviewing Russell Banks, the novelist, and he said that uh, Huckleberry Finn not only was Twain's greatest work, but our Iliad and Odyssey, because Twain alone among writers in the 19th century, American writers in the 19th century, were grappling with the twin themes that Americans had that distinguished us from the European tradition that had written the Iliad and the Odyssey. And he said that those twin themes were race and space, not outer space, but the physical space, the geography of the United States. And I, I realized that Banks had quite you know, simply summarize not only perhaps Twain's great contribution, but what we'd been involved in. Because every time we picked up a subject in American history that we were drawn to, it, it dealt with race or it dealt with space or more often than not, both. And so I think we're defined by this ancient original sin of race and we're defined by our relationship to the land. And and that relationship has reached its sort of zenith now uh, by trying to consider the, the huge power and effect of the national parks. Let's talk about the national parks because it's a perfect example of the issue of space and also race. Yes. I think some people wouldn't, wouldn't really see the connection there, but having seen a, a preview clip of about an hour of uh, the national parks, it very much plays a role in that. And in fact, there's a real strong connection here in the Northwest, Mount Rainier. Uh, one of the uh, people that you uh, focus on was a Japanese um, immigrant and his wife who used to go to Mount Rainier and then eventually were interned during the war, but yet still kept that passion. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. You know, I, I, all while we were working on this, has been a 10 year project, a labor of love for Dayton and me. And, you know, you say we're working on the national parks, and they go, oh, Teddy Roosevelt. And you go, yep, but uh, he's just part of our second of, of six episodes. Oh, John Muir, yep, he dominates our first and second episodes, and his spirit, after he passes away, is, informs the rest of the series. But this is the story of 50 other people who are come from every conceivable background and have really interesting stories to stay. To, to tell and to say, and Iwau and uh, Hane Matsuchida of Seattle fell in love. Uh, they called Mount Rainier their holy mountain with the sort of echoes of Mount Fuji in Japan that they had left. And when his Japanese company recalled him just before the Second World War, he resigned rather than leave his holy mountain. And the great irony and I, I guess shame of the United States is that we saw fit to then in turn, Japanese Americans. Um, he was arrested within the first few hours of Pearl Harbor because not only was he a Japanese citizen, but he'd worked for a Japanese uh, company and was therefore suspect. And uh, they were denied access to their holy mountain. But a kind of perseverance uh, took over. And I think the correspondence between uh, these folks is as beautiful as any correspondence that, that, that we've been able to record in all the films uh, we've done. But this is not just a Japanese American story, it's a Hispanic story, it's an African American story, it's a Native American story, it's about foreigners as well as native born Americans, um, it's about male and female uh, people who fell in love with a particular place and dedicated their lives to preserving it or, or providing the vigilance that we need uh, to have to keep these places there. You know, uh, Dayton likes to say that you know you can lose a place and it's gone forever but once you save it 
it requires you to continually save it, just like liberty itself. And we see the parks as, as sort of the, the whole of the United States written in a different sort of language, that this is the Declaration of Independence applied to the landscape, that it requires our vigilance uh, to make sure that all of those energies that want to, to uh, you know, put a dam here or cut that, uh, that uh, stand of trees or mine that area don't get their hands on these places, these relatively small places that we've set aside and said, you know what, we need to have this. Uh, we need to have this for our souls. We need to have this for the beauty of nature. We need to have this for uh, to take our children to look at something that, w that was the way it was 15,000 years ago and 150 years ago when John Muir looked at it. And we hope 150 years from now or 15,000 years from now where we can look and see the same thing that our ancestors uh, did. This is a hugely important institution we've created and requires all the, the vigorous vigilance that we can and muster uh, to protect it. It seems that uh, your, your, your topics are uniquely American. And is that always going to be what yeah, you I've, do? You know, the, the, the real secret is we've made the same film over and over again. <laughs> you know, this has been 30 plus years of essentially trying to figure out who we are asking that question, who are these strange and complicated people who like to call themselves Americans? We're mechanics. We lift up the hood and we look at what's working and what's not working and try to tell stories. And, and that's, in the end, what it's about. I, I, you know, if I were given a thousand years to live, I wouldn't run out of stories in American history. And perhaps that makes me uh, parochial or provincial that we haven't, you know, looked beyond the shores except in those American stories that have taken Americans beyond our shores. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, we have, uh, have had and have and I hope that we will continue to have a special place in the story of this planet. And that, you know, Lincoln talked about the last best hope of Earth and too many of us um, reduce that in a bad way and, and, and get sort of intoxicated by the myth of exceptionalism. But there is something special about us. And more important, that specialness is in our possibilities. And that requires an incredible amount of vigilance and self-critical views. But it also involves a particularly unique American brand of faith uh, and optimism. And all of those things combine to make great stories. And, you know, we don't have to call it art. We don't have to really put too many heavy labels on it. What we're in the business of trying to do is just tell good stories. And we still feel like students trying to figure out how to make those stories better, how to, you know, be generous, how to include more, how to tell the difficult parts of our history without then ruining the parts that are also incredibly positive, how to mix that good with the bad. Your next project. We are already deep in an update of our baseball series. Really? I remember in 1994 that came out. It was nine episodes, which we called Innings. Uh, now we're working on the 10th inning. Uh, we're doing a history of prohibition that's brought us back. Both projects have brought us back to the Seattle era. Uh, we've got some difficult subjects to, to sort of tackle in baseball, steroids, but we have some uh, wonderful, great actions on the field. And one of the most important people in the history of, of the game of baseball, Ichiro Suzuki, is featured in the oh, film. Really? And it's brought us back, and we've done interviews with him. Is, is that to uh, focus on the fact that it's become so international? Or? Uh, partly that, but I think it's partly uh, who he he is as a human being, quite apart from whatever ethnicity. Yes, he does represent as the huge influx of Latin players, uh, uh, as opposed to the African-American story that we detailed in those first nine episodes. And the, the Latin explosion is a huge part of this, and we've been to the Dominican Republic. Uh, but I think Ichiro represents even something more than just the changing demographics of baseball. Uh, he represents a, a sort of long lost uh, ethos, and as one person says in the film, uh, I'm just happy to be alive in the time of Ichiro. Mm -hmm. And then in our Prohibition film, we discovered an amazing bootlegger who was the king of the Puget Sound bootleggers. And oh, it's really? a wonderful, wonderful story that we intend to focus on uh, intensely in, in one of the episodes, which I think uh, everyone in the country, but particularly folks around here, will enjoy. The digging to try to find these stories, um, I would imagine that it takes a lot of detective work to try to find these unique 
kinds of stories, and then find the visuals at the same time, particularly the archive stuff. This, that's, that's what we do, basically. You know, we can talk a lot about it. We can get excited about it after we've made it to try to convince you to look at it. But the thing that we enjoy most is the searching and the collecting of those stories and, and the things that we write on the one hand and the images that we need to use to help tell that story. And then even more than that, the decisions we make in the editing room that are difficult to see. Uh, to, to sort of carve that block of stone uh, into something that's recognizable as a good story or a good set of stories. And, and that's basically what you pay us for. And the rest of it is the showmanship that has to accompany the raising of the money and the, and the convincing you to, to tune in. And, and that's the stuff we love more than anything else. And I'm so fortunate. I mean, it's so unusual that, that you've got a, it's considered a Ken Burns film, but really it represents the talents of an extraordinary number of really amazing human beings who work really hard, writers and co-producers and uh, associate producers and editors and assistant editors. And, and each this, one of this these is really films a team hand, sport. Oh, it it's is a team totally business. that. It's totally. collaborative uh, in, in the best sense of the word. And the people that I play with are the people that I work with, which is not always the case uh, in, in this business. And, and that, I, I, I think more than anything else, I think shows that we're doing something right. The Civil War, when you made that, it, it really seemed to open the doors for you and to give you the opportunity really to do everything else that you've done in many my, ways. I, my, my now 22-year-old graduating from Columbia University daughter was three and a half just after the Civil War was aired and we were walking in New York City and up ahead maybe 30 yards, uh, somebody stopped and they recognized me and were turning around and she was holding my hand and she squeezed it even tighter and she said, look daddy, they want Ken Burns. And this was before <laughs> Domain, it was, her Ken Burns was all one word and it wasn't daddy or it wasn't me and, and she was giving me a valuable lesson. Uh, the Civil War did open some doors but I, I think that the best thing we did was to make sure that the way we made films was the same way that we had always made films. There were six or seven films before that under our belt that had been celebrated and we thought, my goodness, this was the best possible outcome we could conceive. Um, Civil War opened a lot of doors, but it also uh, made us what's the word, hungrier. We wanted to, to take on, tackle even more difficult subjects and, and figure out how to do that. So you, you, everyone said, oh, the funding must have been easy after that. Well, the funding, <laughs> as everyone in public television knows, right. is never easy. But I think we compounded that difficulty for ourselves by saying, let's try to take on this and take on that and take on more and do more than one thing at once. And, and you've never done really small projects or small topics. I mean, they've always been these huge things. <laughs> well, you know, I think with this idea that we've made the same thing over and over again, that we're asking that question, who are we? It permits a s relatively small biography of Lewis and Clark or Mark Twain or Thomas Jefferson or Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony to s have the same significance, the same importance as taking on something huge like a Civil War or a baseball or jazz or the Second World War or the West or now the National Parks. And, and uh, what I think we are proudest of is a sense that we've tried to, in each instance, invest these films. And I mean the we, not me, but all of the people who've worked on it. We try to invest the films with the very best of ourselves. And so we can sort of happily say to turn it around, which is, if you don't like these films, it's all our fault. We have <laughs> nobody else to blame, certainly not public television, certainly not uh, you know any other external forces. We've worked as hard as we can, and if you don't like it, it's our fault. I wanted to ask you about the Ken Burns effect. We <laughs> talked about the, uh, you really set the standard of, in a, in a uh, still photography, this kind of movement that then also would stop and uh, just really grab your attention with well, still photos that uh, everybody's copied since then. God well, knows we have. Where did that come from? Well. You know, it's interesting that all Apple computers have in their iMovie and iPhoto this thing called the Ken Burns effect. And it's one of those classic modern examples where the technological tail is wagging the dog. For 30 plus years, I have been interested in honoring the power of individual images to convey 
complex information. That required looking at a photograph and not just holding it at arm's length, but going inside and realizing it's the closest to that reality that it was trying to portray. That we can not only show it in its wide shot, but it's medium and it's close. We can tilt, we can pan, we can reveal, we can do inserts. And not only that we look at it and see that it has many stories within itself to tell, but that we can listen to it. You know, are those uh, troops tramping? Are those guns firing? Are the glass, ice cubes in the glass in the bar in the jazz club tinkling? Is the bat cracking? Is the crowd cheering? Uh, what's the music? Is it the period music? Who's saying something? Does it always have to be a, a third person narrator, the voice of God? Could it not also be a chorus of first person voices reading the actual diaries and letters and newspaper accounts? of the period and that together with a whole nother set of techniques may in the end be not uh, an effect but a style and I think that when you then apply it in a computer program to what you can do with your still photographs that becomes an effect but all it is is a is an emotional and human attempt to do that thing that we talked about at the beginning which is try to transfer emotion from one person to another, trying to say, I think there's meaning here, and I believe that if I show it in this way, I can give you a glimpse of the meaning that I think was originally there, that I now feel, and that I hope that you can feel. And that's a much more complicated thing than just uh, sort of tossing something off as an effect. And, and, and brother, that has nothing to do with me. That's <laughs> something above my pay grade. Ken Burns, it is always a pleasure, and thank you for everything you've done in the past and what I know you'll do in the future. Oh, that's very kind. All thank right. you very Ken much. Burns, Great to be you with you. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by... KCTS 9 members, and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation, and by viewers like you.